Hello, and welcome to The Joy of Devving with... Sorry, hello, and welcome to The Joy of Devving with Bob Hess. Uh, uh, today, uh, once again, we are going on as a portion of our uh, ongoing journey, uh, working on uh, creating a dungeon uh, in the DDO, uh, the DDO tool set. Uh, this specific, uh, this specific uh, uh, episode has a, has, is sort of interesting because it gives you a little more of a glimpse into sort of the feedback and polish phase, sorry, feedback and polish phase uh, as, as it sort of pertains to dungeon development. Um, as always, this is a content driven and a content focused uh, development stream. Uh, I'll be talking about the process of making content, how we build content, uh, answering questions regarding content, and all of those types of things. Um, so let's see where we're going to start. All right, uh, let me go over to this. And uh, so I have a whole bunch of different topics that I'm going to go ahead and uh, talk about during the course of this. And to start with, uh, these are the topics that we're going to talk about. Um, when we go and start working on our specific dungeons, uh, there are uh, varied and uh, different types of feedback that we take. Uh, first of all, when we do internal playtests, these are feedback from other designers on the team and other team members, uh, uh, producers, uh, any of the QA folks, anyone who wants to participate and work with us. Uh, so we take feedback from all those folks and uh, put that together. Um, for us, a lot of times this is done uh, just on an internal playtest server. We all get together, we get on voice chat, we talk about things that we've seen, challenges, and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, the next thing that we also take information from is uh, our public feedback. Our public feedback in this case was presenting this dungeon, uh, the, uh, the Kitty Dragon dungeon known as Catastrophe, um, in sort of a more raw form, just so that people can see, as we've sort of discussed and shown, as, uh, as I've moved on in the process and done a few things, um, where we were in that process. Um, feedback on that, however, was, hey, this dungeon isn't done. And a lot of people weren't aware of sort of what we were trying to do as a portion of this feedback uh, process. Um, and then when we get done with the public feedback, we go to polish. And what polish really is, is our act, our iterative act of, of enacting feedback that we've gotten from a variety of different sources and also our own internal uh, particular uh, polish. Like, uh, and a lot of times this is a punch list of things that we want to build. Uh, this is a number of different uh, bits and pieces, and we'll kind of get back to this. Uh, implementing polish is super important. That's really like your ability to react to feedback and implement and interpret that feedback and and implement it in a actionable manner is really the bread and butter of any designer. It's the most important and core thing to do. Um, and it's it's super important. Uh, and the last thing that we're going to kind of go over and during the stream is what's left. Sort of what are the next steps that we need to do to get this dungeon across the finish line, uh, especially with our due date, which is going to be in early December. All right. So first thing I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to start with uh, discussing a little bit about our internal feedback. Um, when we were looking at the internal feedback, the internal feedback that I got uh, has a bunch of stuff having to do with things that that I really needed to do to sort of get it to the next stage. And uh, this is going to be essentially the polish that I did. And that's uh, a preliminary text pass. Like I did a bare bones text pass. This one has a lot more information on it. This is not the finalized text pass where spelling, uh, grammar, and a whole bunch of other stuff goes through. Uh, we have a couple of copywriters as a portion of our staff who do all of that work. Um, other things wanted to mention is, hey, we should probably put in a secret optional, uh, a secret area, and do an optional with a lock chest and some trap stuff and all of those things, which I'm going to show you a little bit later today. Uh, one of the other things that we're going to do is we're going to also show you a little bit more about the optionals themselves. 
Um, and also, do I need to rework the dungeon shell at all? How do I do all of that stuff? And are there any story elements in our initial playtest form? Uh, were they working? Kind of where were they in the process of what it did? And I found a number of different places where I kind of wanted to work on that stuff. Um, and so I'll sort of talk about this more when I bring this back. But one of the next things that we did um, that I was showing you before is essentially public feedback. And one of the lucky things that we can do as a portion of our public feedback uh, is we can watch playtesters uh, in the raw state play these dungeons uh, as they move along. Now, in this case, um, I was lucky enough to have Cordovan, who was kind enough to take some B-roll of, uh, of essentially... of, of essentially a group which was playing through the dungeon in the form that it was in at that time. Uh, this is on Lamania. Uh, one of the things that we can do as, as a group of admins is that we can actually go into the thing. Uh, we can cloak our characters. We can make it so that we could look to see sort of how they're interacting with different stuff and sort of how they're going through each of these different pieces. In this particular case, uh, when, uh, when Jerry was doing this, uh, he actually did some of the text options so that you can see a little bit of it and kind of cut together a little bit of a reel of them going from place to place and kind of finding out information as they go. Uh, you can see that there's a little bit of the combat. Uh, in this particular case, uh, what we presented to uh, Lamania essentially didn't have a lot of uh, additional information. Um, uh, a, a lot of... I uh, didn't have, like, monster placement as a whole didn't have a lot of polish items in like, where do we want additional text stuff? Uh, where did we think that more story elements would be helpful? Um, and some of this stuff was done in sort of a, a, hey, this is what we're showing you as we go. As you can see, uh, this is this video itself is a couple of minutes long, and I'm just going to kind of go through this. Um, some of the things that I added between stuff is that with the dairy person, I added a couple of cows. I added a little bit of deco just so that there's some basic thing. Now, this isn't the finalized deco. This is just a brief set of deco uh, to kind of give the person who's going to do a deco pass, which is one of my coworkers, uh, Flimsy Firewood, who's going to be uh, just kind of improving a lot of those different aspects. Uh, this second phase is just giving him an idea that this, in fact, for the Rust Monster is going to be a forge type room with a lot of those types of elements. A lot of the times when I'm doing that sort of stuff, uh, I sort of want to put in key pieces to give that person sort of additional clues on top of anything I kind of talk through them with. Um, as we see, uh, we're gonna uh, we're gonna kind of go through and take a look at some of the different spaces. Many of these spaces aren't decorated. Uh, there's a number of things like uh, breakables and um, uh, breakables and such which we will eventually and get a chance to kind of uh, put in and so you'll see a little more uh, finalized version of the dungeon. Uh, if you have any questions as we go, as we're sort of watching through this video, please let me know. Um, after this, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to really talk about uh, sort of my polish pass and sort of my implementing polish and where the dungeon is today. And I'm going to do that by stepping through where as of this evening, uh, where the dungeon uh, is for, uh, like, on my own internal server and also where uh, the, the differences and changes that I've made as a portion of that. As you can see, this is a group of players running through. Uh, they're right now doing one of the, the uh, uh, that's one of the, the required objectives. That's the Kenneth person. Um, and then uh, they're just doing some brief combat. But... The great thing about this tool and about this uh, about this ability to do is really is really that we get a chance to watch people how they play. We can watch raids. We can do all of those types of things. Uh, we can watch for aberrant behavior, uh, uh, exploit stuff, and all of that sort of stuff. But this really was to show people, okay, from what I've had a conversation with and what I've talked about, where are we as a whole for the dungeon? Um, and in this case, uh, you can see that, you know, we've added a bunch of different stuff. And uh, even in this particular case, I've added things like 
the gi giant ball and then the breaking down the door and having it go into the final room. Um, I added a laser, which is sort of the laser pointer concept. Now, some of these things are definitely going to be, uh, as a whole, uh, polished, made a little more interesting and things of that sort. Uh, in this case, uh, you can see the final uh, portion of it, which is really, uh, is you fighting a mimic. Uh, I'm going to kind of go into that a little bit more when I step through uh, the dungeon itself. Uh, as, as you see, um, and I have to fix that, but essentially there's a blip in which uh, the uh, which the dragon uh, does a landing animation. I'll kind of show folks this. And uh, what I will do is going to transition now into where we are today. Let me transition over there. And I want to thank again, uh, uh, I really want to thank uh, Cordovan for uh, recording that, just to show you sort of an example of what we're going to be doing. All right, so this is where we are. Uh, as you can see, as a portion of this, uh, NPC appearances have been fixed up. A number of different people have gone through and helped me out with this dungeon. One of the things is uh, someone went through and did this. Um, a number of the, the text information has been changed. And you're going to kind of see a much quicker version of sort of us going through it. Uh, is there a hard engine limit on the size of the texture that you can use? Um, I don't know that off the top of my head. That's something you'd have to ask one of the artists for. Uh, they know a lot more information about that. I don't do much with textures and texture sheets and stuff like that. Um, some of these are using older assets, and that's why some of them look uh, differently. Um, but... Uh, so I've gone through and named all of these uh, NPCs, and this NPC actually goes into the three different people that you have to talk to as we did through that. And then as you come out, um, one of the things that I have on right now as, a, as an admin is that we actually have an aura of smiting. It comes in real, real handy when, uh, when I'm kind of going through. What this will do is automatically kill any monsters uh, that are not orange or red named. Um, but looking at this right now, I know that we need to do a deco pass. Uh, one of my coworkers is going to be nice enough, uh, while I have a, a day or two off to come through and, uh, really polish up the dungeon, uh, in the next, uh, one of these in two weeks, uh, we're going to really look through sort of the more polished version of this. As you can see, some of the things that I've done is that I've separated pods so that the attacks come from there. I've done stuff like have the cat sleeping up top as you can kind of look at it, um, and things of that sort. Uh, and some of it's just little things, like uh, as I run through this, see this, you can see that I've added an ambush, and these monsters come back through as a portion of that ambush. One of the things that I want to do as we go through is uh, I want to make sure that that monster placement and things of that stuff is a little more separated and also uh, not just huge pods of monsters and things of that sort. And um, one of the things that we need to do while we're doing this, oh, uh, these monsters also haven't had their balance pass done. Um, and so they're, uh, the challenge for those specific things aren't quite where they will be uh, in the end. Um, one of the larger changes that I made, um, and I'm gonna spoil a bunch about this dungeon. It's just how this is gonna happen because I kind of wanna show you a little bit of the information of how this went through. Uh, I did some text passing, and one of the things that we identified when we were going through and doing uh, information is, okay, the story, of course we have these, uh, we've sort of talked through as a portion of this stream that we wanna make sure that um, players understand that the Argonessen themselves have transformed these people. How do I actually put that into the game. Well, one of my ideas is to uh, was to take the original rat NPC from the first portion and have you corner them. Uh, and then essentially, they'll tell you their version of sort of what happened. Um, and then one of the other things that I wanted to do at the end, because it really didn't have a satisfying conclusion, um, I have one of the agents of Argonessen come through and kind of answer all sorts of questions about who were these people? Why has this been done? So you're just not like beating up on a couple of different monsters. There's a little more 
background information as a portion of it. And it can also show a little bit more about, uh, for this development stream, I can show a little bit more about uh, uh, like making choices uh, regarding how I scripted this and multiple uh, choice options and what that looks like in our system. All right, so moving on, uh, as you can see, uh, we still have some monsters. And you can see that some of them have in fact been placed around corners, things of that sort. Uh, one of the things that I've added uh, is that originally I had the rat hiding at a corner. And while that was decent, I thought it'd be more interesting to allow that option as, as a part of a different optional. Uh, so in this case, uh, what I did is I added a volume here which says that uh, you you hear a uh, panic squeak. Um, I'm gonna change that text in just a second to be behind the wall. Um, and so what I've done is I've actually added a, uh, I've added one of my hirelings um, because this character doesn't have that skill. Um, and so what it's gonna do, it's gonna put this up. And so when this goes through, it's gonna take a second and then there's a very basic trap, and essentially this is going to start to kind of cycle through, and players can either, uh, players will just kind of have to figure out how to do that. All right, so now what we'll do is we'll have uh, this guy come here, we'll teleport him here, and then we will have Darling go ahead and... So one of the things I'm going to need to do is make sure that that trap, that right there is something that I'm going to have to fix up. But essentially, it's uh, apparently Darling is having problems reaching it, so I'm going to have to uh, fix that. But uh, successfully, I did this, and what's going to happen is uh, these will spurt off one last time, and then uh, all of them will be disabled. I'm going to show you a little bit more about that. Um, uh, so the idea here is that essentially Murph himself has set up this trap, and this is his little enclave with some cheese. This will have tables and a bunch of that stuff. But the idea is that uh, Murph has set up his own little hidey hole, and this is where he's been living. Um, and so what this allows us to do is also have a, a rogue trap. Um, uh, okay, good to know, Strimtom. Thanks for the information. Um, uh, I will have someone take a look at that when we get a chance. But essentially, Murph has this entire conversation tree. That conversation tree is like, hey, I was turned into it by these, uh, uh, by the Arganesson. Uh Yeah, maybe I stole something or something like that. So it's a little less, uh, you know. So, so you get a little bit of a, an idea of why these people, and in exchange for that information, you let them go. Uh, all right. Uh, that. And we'll go ahead and hope that are you not? Okay. We will have to have that little conversation with the hireling, and there we go. Uh, but yes, so the things that we wanted to add as a portion of this is essentially we wanted to make sure that there was a rogue chest uh, that we wanted to place it behind some traps, have the ability for players to disable some traps. Um, and I can also show you sort of how we set those up and testing them um, and all of those bits. Uh, all right. So next up is sort of moving towards the end. We're going to the Weaver. Weaver here gives you this. Uh, we changed some of this. This essentially says that there's, you know, it's going to smash the thing. And rather than having, uh, you know, you get rolled over, we figured that'd be kind of fun to have a couple of bad guys running up and, in fact, get rolled over by the end. Um, all right. Uh, so we're going to run over here. We're going to pull the lever and start this. 
Um, one of the other polished things that hasn't been done in this build so far is the milk fountain. The milk fountain uh, got some appearance stuff done to it. It now looks like a milk fountain. Um, so when you pull this lever, what's going to end up happening is that this is going to, in fact, spawn in and look like that. Um, and you can see uh, that these are the guys. They're all NPCs. This is uh, Gerald Leneth, the, uh, the fine uh, mimic. Uh, he can do that, and this will activate the final fight. Um, it'll just take me a little while to kill this. Uh, you left the rubble floating in the air, probably. Um, I'll take a look through that. Essentially, we'll we'll do a lot of the fine stuff. Uh, what causes the frame rate crash with fountains and DDO? I don't know what you're talking about. Um, if you have a problem like that, I'd highly suggest uh putting that into uh a bug sending them along go ahead and put them in the forums uh and we'll look into it um i know that some of the fountains for a while were really loud um but it's one of the things that i'm sure we can look into uh let's see but yes so this is the final fight um there are ways that i can speed this up uh it's not particularly imperative right this second uh this character is not a past life character, but has decent stuff, so it'll take a little while because uh, I'm just on an elite and the character doesn't have the best gear or all of their filigrees and all of that stuff. Um, but I do test it with a character which is essentially a first life uh, character. Now, as you can see, back up here, you can see it lands, tells you to comfort the dragon, back away you'll see it start pawing at that uh i added this olivia hall npc which essentially allows you to talk to her if you want to find out about all the creatures you encountered tell us about the rat and essentially this is a little thing saying that essentially it the, the rat sold out uh the argonessin when they were talking to more grave university the method uh was a scholar who stole some tomes things of that sort and then essentially we just wanted to add a little more additional information to sort of flesh out why the Argonesson did this to these people. And so it's a little more understandable. Um, and this will bring you back to here. And that little bit is essentially like, hey, we're going to turn it back into this. And then what it's going to do is going to go here. And then it's going to take a little nap. And uh, that's the end of the dungeon. Uh, Oh, yes. Uh, so, uh, so what I can do, uh, uh, let's see. Door. Open. Uh, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, the, 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 the debris up there, what I can do is I can, as a portion of the, uh, uh, the script, I can make it fade out so that when you're running through, uh, you won't see the specific debris. But so that's pretty much where I've gotten it to polish stuff. There's a bunch of other stuff that I wanted to do, but essentially you can see that we've put in a lot of time and effort in the last, say, five to six days to sort of really ratchet up the quality of it, sort of where you're seeing NPCs, seeing a, a little more of the polish regarding um, like monster animations and how animations work. And you'll always find bugs. One of the funnier bugs that currently stands uh, in this, just be a second, uh, is this one. Um, I didn't make this ball of yarn uh, reselectable. Or I made it reselectable. So uh, it will, in fact, roll over people and knock them down and all of that stuff. So one of the things that while we're going through this, I'm going to go ahead and fix that and show you essentially the process in which we go ahead and fix this. Um, that The way that I can find that out is uh, watching players on live. I can watch it through uh, bug when QA people come through this uh, and a number of different things. 
Um, so yeah, uh, that's a little bit about it. All right, so let's go back. I'm gonna go ahead and close this down. We'll go to this. All right, so what are the next steps? Really the next steps are me looking through and doing a play test of this and having uh, our internal people do a play test through, but also while I'm playing through being like, what works, what narratively is interesting, what is adjustable, what are the places that we wanna move this? And also looking through the different forums and seeing, hey, I found this problem, this is a challenge, this is all of this sort of stuff. and what what do we do about those particular problems? Um, so I guess what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop in uh, and I'm going to show you a little bit about the the way that I'm going about fixing some of these problems and showing you a little bit more about this in the tool set themselves. Um, one of the things we, of course, try to do while we're doing this is show more about the tools and kind of give people a little bit under a better understanding of what's what's happening. Um, one of the things that we did is because there's supposed to be a ritual, we added this uh, set piece so you can look at it. Um, we changed the appearance of this guy. Uh, one of the things coming coming forward from this is that there's gonna be a teleport that sends you back through there that gives you the ability to do that. Um, these NPCs, uh, yeah. All right, so the first thing on my list that we're gonna do, oh, and I apologize for the flight speed of what's happening. I'm sorry if people are getting horribly sick while I do this. All right. Um, what I'm going to show you is the yarn ball. So how does the yarn ball work? Well, the yarn ball is here and is placed here. And its final resting place is in fact determined by these points. Because this is on a patrol, and that patrol will tell the direction and location of where it's going to go. And so it's going to hit each of these patrol points and come to rest at this location. Um, one of the neat things that we can do as a portion of this, um, one of the things that we can do uh, as a portion, like one of the things that we can do as a portion of our scripting stuff is as a portion of the patrol system, is have when NPCs or monsters hit locations on a patrol path, we can set some properties. Those properties here are listed, and in this case is AI logic activate eight. So I set this up pr uh, previously. Um, I'm gonna set that to one because that should be one. Um, but essentially what those uh, what these do are tells me at this point, uh, this this node runs a script. It runs a script called AI Logic NPC Activate Eight, um, and uh, this particular monster should stop patrol at this location, um, and it should run to this node. Uh, the fast movement for the creature is it's set to run, uh, so that it looks a little bit different. Um, all right, so how do I set that up? So what does that mean? So that uh, AI activate eight, when you look at it, is that we're gonna look at our script system. Uh, and as a portion of our script system, uh, we have a couple different scripts. Now, there are three different types of scripts in our scripting system. There are client scripts, which are running client script only, uh, we wrote, this is for only things that players can view on their own client, but don't have any references to server or any objects regarding server. We have dot scripts. Those run both on the client and the server, and there's some information which is passed before. And then the server scripts, which are uh, essentially scripts which don't involve visuals, but also essentially have a lot of information which our, our servers themselves need for these specific objects. Um, uh, does that use the NVIDIA physics engine to accomplish that? Uh, in this case, what we're using is we're using the Havoc engine. Um, that's a part of what we've been using for a while. Um, uh, 
so, and this patrol system is something that we've developed as a portion of our internal tools, which allows us to do any of those types of different things. Essentially, that that yarn ball, what it does is it has an animation. That animation is to roll. The speed at which it rolls is set by the animators themselves, and it essentially allows us to do a walking patrol that looks like a giant yarn ball rolling through the entire screen. Um, make the yarn ball a uh, random color instead of each instance. So theoretically, we could do that, but one of the problems that we're going to need to do and one of the things that we're going to go back and fix is when you select that specific yarn ball in client, you notice that it is currently set uh, to look like a ball of twine. Uh, that's because this object, in fact, if I was to... Uh, see let me remove this uh, this is what that object looks like if i was to remove all colors but one of the things that we can do is that we can on the fly in certain cases render things certain colors and so in this case i rendered this a deep blue to match some of the key art uh, that we did that doesn't work for everything it doesn't work for a whole bunch of different stuff but it is one of the uh, uh, one of the ways that we can go ahead and set up that information. Um, let's get back to it. Um, so one of the problems that we're having right now is that uh, when this uh, particular object comes to rest, uh, just give it a second, it is thinking, all right. Uh, when it comes to rest, uh, we need to take a look at the scripts that we have on it. So we have this kitty, uh, this is the Kitty Dragon Boulder script. And right now what we're doing is we're looking at uh, at this script. And what this does is it tells it to stop the script, which is essentially the script that gives it the rolling appearance. So it stops rolling. And then this, and uh, this toggle state of false, essentially this turns off the knockback feature on the, uh, on the object itself. So what I'm gonna need to do is after all of that's happened, um, for safety's sake, a lot of times we put a small timing delay in our instances. And what I'm doing is essentially just adding a couple of different pieces to the sequence. And what I'm going to do is uh, we have a series of things called properties. And these properties uh, can be set on these objects. And one of the, the properties that we're going to set on this is uh, can't be used and also probably uh, never selectable. Um, and so what's gonna happen is when it hits that final point, uh, because it's got this reference for active A8, it will stop rolling, take two seconds, make sure that it turns off uh, the toggle state, which in this case has the knockback and also additional damage and stuff. Um, and then it'll wait 0.2 seconds. And then in this case, what it's gonna do is uh, we're going to select a property and we have a whole host of properties. Uh, I know this stuff just because it's stuff that I've been, you know, working on for a while. Uh, and in this case, what we're going to do is selectable. Uh, all right. Uh, start with the never selectable through. What I'm going to do is what this tells it to do. Uh, that collection, what it means is to run all of these simultaneously. And there's going to be a couple of properties we're going to run. Uh, and in this case, I'm just trying to remember. Uh, use the keyword of used. Uh, Used can be used false. Uh, I can switch if that was to be true there. But there we go, making it false. So essentially what I've done in this specific script is I made sure that when it hits that location, it's no longer selectable. It's no longer able to roll back over people uh, or just roll mindlessly at that specific 
So, um, and that's what some of the fine tune, like bug iteration looks like when you're doing content development. I mean, a large portion of when we're going through and we're doing a bunch of this stuff is iterative passes being like, okay, so what functioned well, what didn't function quite as well as we had want, wanted, um, what looks, what appears to be working well, uh, is there something that we need to do? Um, one of the things I'll probably end up doing because of that little blip for the uh, dragon for a second, um, uh, it will do stuff. Yes, uh, that one, uh, one, this is a fix that I put in. It will also knock down the boss. Uh, no longer knock down the boss like it was doing beforehand. Um, it shouldn't have been doing that. Um, and hopefully that'll be a uh, fix. Um, it's a shame that you can't use the, the ball uh, in, as, in the final fight. It would be great if we could, um, given the time that I have right now, and given uh, the opportunities that we have and sort of the way that this has been set up, I don't see a real good way that I could make it interactable in which it would be usable by players in a way that would feel good. Um, I love the idea that perhaps in a, another thing that there might be something where you could pull a switch and, you know, you could run a boulder down one side and then it would get caught behind a door and do that again and do some sort of like boss mechanic like that. Um, that's something that we could do in the future. I'll probably steal that because that sounds like a fun fight. That sounds like a fun puzzle uh, thing and also maybe a great way to do something in which there's a boss with a shield, you have to hit it with something heavy or hit it with a magical orb to remove that temporarily. Those are all ideas and those are things that are totally on the, the board. But for this specific thing, um, really what we're doing is the effect that it's going to do is do the knockdown on the people. Um, it is a shame that we can't use it. But however, every time we do something like this, it gives us opportunity and ability to figure out what can we do next time? What's something that we have in, in sort of our bag of tricks for ideas of when I want to do a more challenging boss fight? Could I use this sort of rolling boulder as something? Uh, in the past, every time we've used this rolling boulder, it's been something that's been against the player and there's been a dodge mechanic to it. In this case, I simply wanted to use it because it's sort of a fun, oh, I get to roll roll down and knock over the NPCs before we fight them and gives players sort of a, a little bit of a fun, like relaxing uh, sort of vibe. All right. Um, so... What we're going to do next, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, process that file. Uh, we can take a look at a little bit more of the information uh, that we're looking at regarding uh, feedback and polish stuff. I change it from a boulder to a meteor and have it knock a flying boss down the ground. We could theoretically do that. There are some challenges with it. Flying in our engine is sort of exciting and uh, can be a little uh, challenging to work with, but maybe that might be something that we could do in the distance. Um, in this case, uh, no chance of sound effect of uh, bowling pins falling, I bet. Um, very doubtful. I could check with our sound guy to see if we happen to have that on hand, but, but that would be great. Um, maybe what I'll do instead is have some overhead text before it hits them uh, and maybe move them down to the bottom and and have them like scream, like run, 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 and then they get hit or something like that. That's absolutely something I could do pretty easily. Um, one of the things at this point is I'm probably not going to be asking for more assets. There aren't, there isn't really enough time to turn around something like that. New sound assets are really challenging to do at this point. It's not something we're going to do. Um, one of the things that is going to happen as a portion of the process, which isn't done at this point, is our VO and VO recording. Um, that's going to take place next Tuesday. It's going to be an in-house recording. Um, we don't do it very often, but in this case, um, either myself or Cordovan are going to be doing the voiceover and kind of going through and doing the reading for the text. But before we do that, there's going to be a pass on all of the text so it gets updated and ready for a script. And I'm going to guess that Cordovan's going to do it, but uh, they want me to try it, so I'm going to try it. And uh, so 
we'll have a chance to do it. And we'll take a look and sort of see how all of that comes through. And one of the things that we're going to do for that is for the next stream, we're going to record a portion of that so you can sort of see the process we go about when we're actually doing that. I know it will be neat if I get a chance to do it. There's some technical limitations. My setup's pretty good, uh, but we want to make sure that it sounds decent in game. And uh, Cordovan has a much better setup than I do uh, at my own house, all of that stuff. But it's super exciting. Uh, can't wait to bring that to you guys in two weeks' time. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch back to a little bit more of the information about what I've taken from uh, the polish and the feedback that I've taken. The preliminary text pass. Um, when I do my first and second text pass, I make spelling errors. They sometimes go to live. We really try not to have that happen. Our copy editors do a really good job, but every once in a while, I butcher the English language. It is not the best I should be doing better. It's a mistake that I make. However, a lot of times I'm just trying to get text in for reference so that the people which are doing the text pass, they sometimes actually rework and reword what's happening. So I'm really trying to give them an idea of the thought that I'm going with for this particular encounter. And if they don't get along, along to a text pass to make sure that it's passable enough for it to get through to the player. So that is an important portion of it. Uh, in this particular case, uh, I have a text deadline. That text deadline uh, is tonight. Following the stream, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to check in my work, uh, set it. I'm fairly happy with how most of the stuff is set up. Uh, the information that's displayed and all of those types of things. And we'll go over to two uh, members of our team, Knockback, and I don't know what the other person's uh, particular handle at this very moment is, uh, but both of them do a lot of our text pass work. Uh, they'll go through, they'll clean up a lot of the wording and all that stuff, and a lot of the uh, abhorrent spelling and all of that fun stuff. Um, so one of the other things that I did want to do is I definitely wanted to work on that secret area. And I think that that secret area has some different options. Uh, however, one of the things I really didn't get a chance to do is show you how the trap stuff works and things that I'll probably want to do to make this a little more interesting. Uh, in this case, uh, we're going to go back to World Builder. And now that that's set up, I'm going to show you a little bit more about our trap system because I think that that's kind of interesting and kind of uh, has a little more depth to it than some of the stuff happens. So how does this trap set work? Okay, so this object right here is one of our traps. It's one of our spitter traps, and it has a bunch of different options. That particular one, uh, when we bring up this panel, uh, there is something called trap, and what it does is it describes sort of what type of damage it's doing uh, the delivery mechanism, um, some of our trap types allow us to do bolts. Some of them don't, depending on this. In the particular case of this, um, I grabbed this from another dungeon. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, I'm going to go back and actually rework uh, what we're going to do. Uh, in this particular case, what I'm going to do is I'll change this to fire. Um, after we kind of go through, you can take a look. Uh, these are most of the normal ones that we do. Some of them you can see are sort of one-offs, like honey. That's from uh, Slavers 2. When we sprayed people with honey, that'll have that appearance and also give the effect of that. Uh, we'll do fire because fire is fun. Um, now, one of the more interesting portions of it is uh, when we're working with traps, we have a bunch of different options, and that those options are here. And it's essentially... Is there initial delay when we tell this trap to go off? Uh, is there initial delay when uh, for a persistent trap? In this case, uh, uh, in this case, I'm going to probably have to rework the other ones. So what what is this? Is how long will this uh, persistent trap start? How long will it stay on after the first part of your pattern? And then how long will it, will it stay off? So in this case, what it's doing is it's lasting for two seconds. 
Um, and it's going to stay on for about two seconds and then it will stay off for four seconds. And what we're doing is I'm trying to set it up so that essentially there is a sequence in which all of this stuff. Um, this is really fiddly. It is a huge pain in the butt. Uh, there's some ways that we can play test some of this. Um, however, it is not always as usable as we would like it to be. But I can, I did that. Uh, one second, let me see. I set something uh, that what it is, is, uh, is test disable. Okay. This allows me to set traps in world builders. So in this case, what I can do is I can go here. Second, I'm trying to remember where this is. This has been a little while since I've done this. Um, trying to remember, is it can be used? Nope. Uh, I'm trying, oh, I know the other way that I can do this is by doing this and we can go to script and we can, through this, this shared trap. I'm sorry, I'm just trying to remember this. It's been a little while since I've actually tried to play test this while on screen. Probably not the best thing to do while I'm here. Okay, so what this will do is this will show how long it will last. Uh, if I persistently activate it and it'll, it'll give me an idea that this will in fact last for about four seconds and then disable while I have that available. Um, it's a little tough to, to do multiple of these, but this is showing me exactly what that pattern looks like. So if I was to hit F7 and go down to trap advance, and I made this, let's say if I make this 10 seconds. Stop this. And I'll start it. And you can see that what this is doing is lasting longer than it was previously. Pretty neat. It kind of gives us a bunch of different uh, options and availabilities and sort of how this specific trap works is when this opens up, uh, this is going to set these off. And then the delay before each of them uh, is what sort of tells you the pattern that it's going to do. Um, one of the things that I want to do is when this goes off, so one, two, three, four, I bet you I need to save it between different things and reload it for it to, to work in real time. Um, this is not the most intuitive portion of our tool set, um, but uh, let's see here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to change this. Uh, let's set this initial delay to this and then two. And then I'm going to change this to four. And what we're going to do is we're going to see if this will do what I think it's going to do, uh, I just have to turn off that world builder option because it does not great things on our game client. All right, I'm gonna stop that. Uh, is it possible to give a trap a random amount of time on and off? Yes. Uh, the way that we would do that is with an extra object and essentially a random node, which would allow you to uh, like essentially it will randomly determine that and then shoot that property to it. It would be a pain in the ass. It isn't something that I would want to do normally for traps, but it is something that we are theoretically capable of it. Uh, can you display the wires that show the cone effect? Ah, uh, I'm trying to remember how to do that. And I don't remember off the top of my head. I think it's a console command um, and um, 
I'm going to pass on that for the moment. Um, but essentially what it will do is it will draw, when we're testing these, you can actually draw the triangle to see where it's going to hit. Um, but that is something that I'm a little less comfortable uh, showing you folks, uh, just because uh, that visualization, uh, first of all, I don't remember how to do it off the top of my head. I'd have to look up in documentation. And uh, if you guys want to watch me spend 30 minutes going through a website as I look through our old wiki, I can, but I don't think of that time is as effective as uh, kind of playing around with this and showing you that stuff. Um, one of the other things that I'm going to do uh, is when this door opens up, I think it is a little more interesting. Currently, what it's doing is it's revealing these as they're set to go off. So I'm going to save this. And we're going to go into the actual client and take a look at this. Give me a second while I add this. All right. Uh, some folks have been uh, asking some interesting questions. Um, if you have any other questions about this process or things that we want to do, um, one of the things that I can show you as uh, as that information is adding in the background. Um, so a lot of times when we have these tools, they have different options as a portion of them. One of them is trap difficulty. And what this is, is a scaled. How difficult is this? This isn't this doesn't have a real number. Um, equated to it, but it's essentially, given the difficulty of the dungeon, how much additional CR is in this. In this case, I tend to mark most of my stuff easy or fairly easy, uh, just so that players have a better chance of disarming them. Um, to look at one of these traps, one of the things that we can look at is how this is set up. So what it's set up is, is that this door, when it opens, we can look here, uh, toggle open, will persist and activate all three of these traps. There's links that tell them to do that. And so if I go to one of these, um, you can also see that what I have to do is I actually have to uh, hand attach each of these to this specific trap box to tell it when I disable this, uh, I disable this trap. Uh, and that's done by doing something like this. And you can see we have a whole bunch of different options. Uh, we can even do stuff on critical failure or critical success. Um, we don't do a lot of that. Um, and then at the end of this, what I can do is I can deactivate it, uh, persistent deactivate it, all of that stuff. Um, and we can also do stuff like hide or unhide them if we want to. Um, in this case, I don't think we're going to need to hide or unhide them, but it's kind of neat. Um, could you have something like another trap activate if you critically fail? Absolutely. You could uh, do that pretty simply. Um, punitively, gameplay-wise, that's a little rough. You've already destroyed a trap. Uh, you've already made the uh, space a little more difficult. Would I do that? It really depends on what you're trying to do. I do that in an optional portion. If there's something like a neat reward at the end of it. Um, uh, on critical failure, you could spawn a monster, you could spawn a number of different things. Um, essentially, anything that we can link off of is something that we can do. And we also have another way to kind of get around that and add to different stuff. But those are options that we have in our tool set. They're just stuff that we haven't done as uh, recently. Um, I would probably not do a on critical fail spawn a monster just because they've already messed up. They've already eliminated players to get that specific XP, things of that sort, um, unless it was a specific storyline portion of it. Um, uh, so that's built into the trap itself, but that is a portion of how it does. So essentially built in when, when it critically fails, it's why it explodes, but it also gives us option to do something else. So if we wanted to do, you know, some spinny spike traps when it failed, we could totally do that. Um, so in this case, what I can show you is, uh, 
uh, because it works similarly, uh, this is going to take a little bit of doing, but since I'm showing you folks stuff, I might as well play a little bit. Um, let's see, this stuff is in one of our places. That's an interactive. Let's look at trap. Uh, let's see. Dart jam FDE. Nope. Oh, that's the wrong thing. I was in the wrong thing. I was like, why, why doesn't that have the information that I'm looking for? Oh, because I'm in the wrong objects. Uh, trap. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, spell. What we can do is we can do... What type of trap do we want to do? Uh, do we want to do uh, a sword trap, something like that? Yeah, let's do a sword trap. Let's have this sword come here. And what we're going to do is on successful, I'm going to just show you what it is. So let's say uh, on disable. So if you successfully disable it, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, persistent activate this trap. Let's take a look at this trap. Uh, I'm going to delete this and remove this, but just so you folks can kind of tell uh, what a trap would look like, let's do that this is, this difficulty setting will, will tell you essentially how much damage it does and things of that sort. Um, let's do an attack bonus of a hundred so that people don't get missed by it. Um, and let's save that and see if that all works. Um, yes, at this point, I don't have an on ordinary fail, but that is something that you could theoretically do. Um, yeah, alarm sound is definitely something cool. Um, that would be neat. We could do, we could even put it into something which uh, gives player text for that sort of stuff. But um, I just wanted to sort of show how we go about doing that. Uh, to give you an idea of how this looks when it goes off, we can enable. Okay. It's one of these. All right. So that's going to be an open. So what we'll do is we'll copy this, copy position, paste, position, drag that out, grab two of these, and I'll toss these on the ground, have them line up there. That one, the linked one, I'll delete that. And then we'll go link start on trap disable, link end, toggle open. And what this will do is this will shoot out all of these. Now, there are ways that I can set it so that it will keep on activating, but a lot of these are one and done. Uh, and so we have to do some more ridiculous scripting to do it. But I figured I'd show you how we can set up a, a simple blade trap in this particular case. And uh, we can go through and play test that real quick. Because really, it's one of the more fun things that we have the opportunity to do. And one of the things that we can do as a portion of our things is that we have a lot of pre-built things that are pieces of our tool chest that we can add as we did. But as you can see, each of these pieces takes a certain amount of time. And a lot of the, the difficulty for this stuff and sort of the finesse of it uh, can get a little frustrating. And 
Um, you know, there have been times when I've done a whole bunch of work on a on a on a quest, and I'm like, oh hey, I'm just gonna do this trap room. I have this idea. Uh, these can be very fidgety. Um, sometimes doing something like this can completely blow the amount, like the estimate of the amount of time it's going to take because you want to make sure that it's a fun experience and you get chances to play test it. And one of the challenges of the engine, which is an awesome engine and does a lot of things, is that we can't live reload this stuff. So every time I want to test it, make changes, I actually have to bring up a server, bring down a server, all of that sort of thing. How do you decide uh, to put on the far side instead of before, or do you have special rules that are followed? Okay, so we have de design conventions which change over the course of our product's lifetime. Um, one of the things that we have moved to is that since we know that certain trappers don't have access to uh, to full evasion, we've moved so that trap boxes should be in all cases before the actual application of the thing. It's a designer rule. It's what we're supposed to do in content. Um, there are some certain cases in optionals or something that we want to do and make it super hard. We can, but we tend not to pr prefer to do that. But it's something that we do just because we know the reality of the gameplay of it. Previously, uh, before there were artificers, a lot of times the the older content is considered, you just have a rogue. This is what we're going to be doing. Um, yeah, like boxes after, uh, after traps sometimes take a lot of real life skills or knowing how those specific traps work. A uh, number of other challenges. Now, granted, some of that's learned and interesting and emergent gameplay. However, the challenge is that for newer players or people which haven't interacted with those types of things, it can cause a lot of challenges. So as a rule of our current content team, we will do this. However, in the past, that's not how it's always gone. There are times that people make mistakes or make choices that they're not going to do it. Um, they sometimes have decent reasons. Sometimes it's just as a portion of as it gets built, this is sort of how it goes. Um, so one of the benefits of being in this team, uh, have we considered re revamping older content to move the trap boxes to before the trap? We will sometimes do that if we happen to be in that space and reworking it. Um, we, don't, we don't tend to revamp little bits of content from time to time, but there are times that if we have time, we can go ahead and do a pass of that. But a lot of times we're working on the next, next dungeon pack, the next whatever. Uh, at this point, after this, uh, we're going to be working on an expansion at some point. We're going to be working on another dungeon pack. We already have plans for that. We have certain content developers working in those directions. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hop into the client. And then uh, I'm going to do one other thing. It'll take a quick moment while we're putting this together. All right, so that's a little bit about traps. That's a little bit of how we set up traps. Um, one of the other things that I can show you as we do that is this is the secret doorway. This is an object. That is the wrong one. Oh, second, I made an oopsie. Uh, I have to go back and fix something because I put the wrong type of doorway down. And that could be a problem when we go in live. Uh, so anyway, uh, I can talk about that in a little bit, but essentially uh, one of the things that we can do is we can look at this door and we can look at its properties. And one of the things is, um, uh, is the detection. And detection is, if this is in fact a hidden object or a hidden uh, item, uh, is it detectable? Yes, this tells you whether or not a secret door is actually detectable, uh, or if it's something that has to be revealed by something else. One of the other things, uh, uh, 
uh, and then how difficult is it to detect with the search skill? Um, so that's where we set that information and how we sort of set up that stuff. Uh, give me one second while I, I will pop us back into client right there. Take a second. Kitty Dragon. If I was smart, I would have made the dungeon name. Uh, there'll be a neat splash screen for this. It'll take a little bit. Uh, someone else from our art team is working on it. Uh, some real neat stuff, though. Uh, all right. So in this case, since I'm testing this specific thing, uh, what I am doing is getting a teleport location, which is near this location. What this will do is teleport me in this room uh, so that I don't have to play through everything. Uh, I don't know why that's always selectable. All right, you come over here. We're going to go ahead and search this this you can see that this timing is a little bit better with these uh, having a more distinguished pattern because of the timing stuff that I adjusted and so you could very easily if we wanted you to get past and and I do want people to be able to get past this is to walk through this all right so I'm gonna stand here, I'm gonna summon you. We're gonna do this, and then you're going to disable this. You can see on, on disable, it went ahead and shot that back up. Um, essentially, if I set it to a persistent thing, we can have it so it shoots up a number of different things. But that's just an, uh, an instance of what we can do. Um, you can see in some of our uh, earlier dungeons, we did stuff like, if you miss traps or you open up a chest, we can shoot out stuff. Uh, we can do any of those types of things and it gives us a real wide breadth of options while we're working on this. All right. Now, while we do that, just give me one second. Uh, that name like that? Hold on a second. Just want to look at something real quick. Okay. Ah. Uh, but yeah, uh, so that's uh, essentially how we set this up. Uh, and that's how we do traps and things of that sort. And uh, it's really neat because what this will do is this will persistently do a pathway which will face this wall. It'll hit every two seconds and allow us to do a, a walkable through puzzle like the olden days um, before we get through Murph. Yes, there is some deja vu while you go through a number of these things, while you start working on larger trap rooms and the like. Uh, you get used to it, you, you, it takes some time um, but actually, it's pretty enjoyable, and it's kind of neat that we get an opportunity to sort of fool around with this stuff. Um, trap rooms are sort of a... We like to put traps in several of the dungeons uh, as a thing. The more traps that we include when we do traps, we just want to make sure that they're in optional locations, um, or if their primary path, that they have a gameplay aspect which allows them to be by bypassed, by players who do not have trap stuff. Uh, uh, yes, uh, the person who made Undermine no longer works at the company. They have made some decisions. Um, uh, that is not something that I would ever do. Um, I went through and reworked some of Undermine. It's kind of interesting. I hope people like the revamp. Um, one of the things that I tried to do when I was working on that specific portion of it um, is essentially set up I uh, set it up so that doing disarming one of those objects 
or gave ways so that trying to pick traps was better than just blow up traps. Hopefully people like it. I don't know if people do, but uh, it's always good things to get feedback on. Uh, I'm pretty happy with it. When we played through it, I, I was pretty, like me and my uh, regular play group, um, one thing that doesn't always get talked about is that some of us have our own play groups. I have a play group. We play every, uh, we play every Monday night. Um, play through as much of the content as we can. Uh, I'm an active player. I have a number of capped characters. I have a couple of reincarnated characters. Characters that raid. Um, I think that that's a healthy thing for content folks to do. Um, some folks play a little bit more than others. Some not as much. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things that I, as a designer, feel is kind of important. All right, so now that I've shown you that, uh, what I'm going to do is show you sort of where we're heading with this and kind of what's coming up next. Uh, so where, let's just make sure that I've covered everything that I said I was gonna talk about uh, in this particular case, sorry about that. Um, uh, essentially, uh, so you can see the work that I did on preliminary text pass. You can see the secret area. You can see that the optionals have been improved. See that I reworked the dungeon shell that was for that specific location, setting it up so that there's a place where uh, I can do the trap setup and also make the rat. Um, there's also a context clue that you can hear the rat, which reminds me at this moment, I need to go through for the rat discovery and a wall. Uh, let's see here. Uh, approach the wall. Sorry, I was just thinking when we were going through it. Uh, I remember that that one piece of text is going to be something that's going to be uh, pretty important um, uh, as we move forward. Uh, all right, so. Uh, and reworking the story elements. One of the things I really wanted to do is I wanted to impress with that entire concept that there is a series and there was a group of, uh, of monsters. One of the things that I sort of went back and forth with, and I'm sort of interested in your guys' opinion, um, do you think that you should defeat the, uh, you should finally kill the Mimic, or do you think that the Mimic itself should teleport out at the end? Because one of the ideas is that this could be an ongoing villain, or this could be a one once-off thing. And I'm trying to determine which one I kind of prefer. And so I'd love to hear uh, information about that. We can kind of... Uh, uh, I have to write some dummy text for it, but uh, it's one of the things that I'll do uh, as a portion of it. Uh, and I can kind of go from there. Uh, but, uh, yeah. All right. So lastly, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to our previous description of what's on today's stream. So I've talked about the internal feedback. I've talked about the public feedback. Uh, I've talked about polish. Um, one of the interesting things about public feedback is that a lot of times what I'm doing is I'm gathering what they're saying. And as a designer, my job is to interpret that feedback into actionable, uh, doable things and also have an idea overall of will this feedback add to the experience? Uh, that's some of the design experience portion of it. Uh, so that whole process is, in fact, one of the most challenging things to do as a designer. It's one of the things that I really, really uh, dig. I think it's really uh, okay. As for the mimic ending, please leave it as ambiguous like the thing. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, oh, nice, nice. I see some some people saying that maybe I should leave it. So maybe I'll leave it. Maybe we'll we'll end up doing that. Um, uh, yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, now I'm getting messages while I'm in the middle of the stream from my coworker, and uh, he said, uh, you know, making uh, you know mocking me a little bit about this is like, uh, sh should this mimic escape and become a recurring villain? And uh, and his response was yes, and he should come back to you and. By Nat Gan's body inside it. That's clearly what 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 they they want to have happen. That's not what's going to happen, but it's a pretty good joke. Thought it was kind of funny. Uh, I wanted to share with you guys and uh, knock uh, knockback will really appreciate that I actually mentioned it live on stream. All right, so um, going back to it. Um, so what what have we done? Uh, I've taken internal feedback. I've taken a whole bunch of public feedback. I've reworked a 
large portion of this entire stuff. Uh, and I've worked on polish and started implementing polish. There's a bunch more polish that I'm going to be doing. It'll be going on over the next two weeks. That's really the, the time that we have. Uh, some of that will be uh, voiceover and voiceover timing, making sure that all the voiceover stuff works. That's some of the things we're going to see. And let's see what's left. What do I have left in this dungeon? What will make it a complete thing? Um, we will go back to my good friend Notepad++. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and transition over there. And right now you can see the dungeon where I made that one change. Uh, so let me just do something else while I think about it. Hit blend. All right. So what's left? So one of the things that we have to have, make sure are in every dungeon are collectibles. I have to add collectibles. I have to add breakables. We have to add rest shrines. In this case, this is a lighter combat dungeon. I'll probably add one to two rest shrines, one before the end boss fight and uh, one before the other. Monster entrances. What does that mean? Uh, can you folks see this? Uh, hopefully this is readable. I can go ahead and zoom in a bit. Um, there you go. All right. So, uh, so monster entrance states. This makes the monsters themselves look a little more alive, more purposely placed, not just large groups. I've already done a bunch of this work, but I'll probably do a bit, bit more of it. Um, Flimsy Firewood is going to be nice enough uh, to go ahead and do a deco pass on my dungeon. There'll be a bunch of work. Uh, I'll take a look at that when I get back uh, from uh, a long weekend because uh, I'm taking a couple of days off. Um, and then uh, the text pass. The text pass is going to be done by our folks doing copy editing. They are wonderful. Um, they help me out so very much. Having people which are capable and much better at that sort of thing. I'm a little better on gameplay. I'm a little more on sort of uh, player expectations, things of that stuff. Um, these folks save my bacon time and time again. I cannot say enough nice things about them, um, but they're going to do a text pass on my dungeon. Um, and then I'm going to have to reread through that and make sure that uh, it is good to go for when we do the recording. Um, do, do you balance boss fights based on how close the last rest shrine? Do you put a rest shrine right before the boss fight to kind of boost... So we, as a design team, really try to put a rest shrine near the uh, the last fight, just because it's pretty imperative, um, given that that's really where we want to challenge push. If we do more of a distance between those two things, um, it is something that we try to consider, but really one of our better practices is to do that. But it isn't 100%. It isn't how each of the developers might want to do in that specific case. Or if they're trying to do something which is more of a long drawn out uh, attrition of abilities, those are things that we could do, but that would be something that I personally would warn against. Um, but for the most part, we we want end fights to be a little more challenging, to have a little more combat mechanics. I think in our last set of dungeons, we did some with a whole bunch of real challenging uh, difficulty and all that stuff. I loved a bunch of those. I want to change one or two abilities, but for the most part, I thought that was neat. But I, but yes, essentially, we want you to be full up to go into those experiences because it's supposed to be difficult. Uh, all right. Uh, I was saying text pass. Text pass is what those folks will be doing. Then voice recording. It'll be me, Cordovan, Knockback, and maybe one or two other people sitting in. Uh, we're going to see who's going to do the voiceover. In this case, it's probably going to be me or Cordovan. We'll see at the end. Kind of see how it all comes together. And so uh, that's kind of exciting. And then we'll do a second internal playtest. Um, this is more of the done version. So that if there's any last minute polish stuff that doesn't change stuff like VO. One of the challenges when we do VO. Uh, when we do classic and uh, normal VO is. Once that is recovered. Once that is recorded. That's it. We don't get another recording session most of the time. Uh, especially with the specific voice actors. So when we do a text pass and when we do a text lock, any DM voice that we put in and DM uh, audio, we need to make sure that it's listed in our document and, and set um, because we won't get a chance to go back and do it again. Uh, every once in a while, we might get lucky enough to get someone. If many years down the line, we need someone to reread something, we can, but that isn't something that happens normally. So 
so as of six o'clock tonight, uh, or sorry, seven o'clock uh, Eastern time tonight, uh, I will be finalizing uh, what I consider done when the text pass is done, done. Uh, that is what's going to get read and that's what's going to get recorded. And that's what's going into the game. Now we may not use a lot of it. We may also include, and we might record a whole bunch of extra lines uh, just in case we want to do it. One of the things I'm going to do is put in an extra set uh, so that I can swap out the text for uh, if the mimic, rather than dies, uh, teleports away. And I'm going to do that in a little bit. But anyway, so that was my stream. Uh, hopefully you guys got some good information regarding this. Uh, hopefully you got a decent uh, understanding of a little bit of what we're doing for tools-wise, uh, what we're doing, uh, and how we do polish. I got to show you a little bit more about our trap system, our secret object system, um, and uh, show you a little bit of like how we go about bug fixing, what are problems that could present themselves, um, how do you bugs in specific dungeons, and this discussion here, how does it sort of give us ideas of what we can do in our next dungeon? Um, and I like that idea of maybe having uh, like a moving back and forth boulder or something with some sort of control gives me an idea for maybe something I want to do in the future. Uh, I really appreciate everyone joining us for these streams. Um, there'll be, my guess is that there'll probably be two more. There's at least one more, which will be uh, the 30, will be the end of the month. Um, and then I might do a postmortem one. Um, after the thing is released and just uh, at the end of the year kind of be like, and here's after release. Here's everything that we had to do or just do a general, hey, do you have questions? Do you have questions about it? Do you want me to show you different bits? Um, and uh, I'm so glad that folks were able to join us. Um, really appreciate all of our time and effort, all of your time, all of your thought, all of your questions. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out to us through forums, all of that sort of stuff. Super excited to do this. Once again, this is the Joy of Devving with Bob Hess. I hope you folks have a lovely evening, uh, and thanks so much for joining us. Give me one second, and there we go. Bye, folks. <laughs>